Okay, we're here this evening in the grounds of the uh, Fiery Church in Ballyhonus. It's now closed, but uh, you might notice my attire this evening. I'm not sure when this uh, interview will go out, but uh, we're on the eve of a big day in Mayo football. We're taking on the dubs again tomorrow in the All-Ireland semi-final, and we keep hoping that we'll turn them over at least one more time since uh, 2012. So, uh, more about that another time, I suppose. But this evening I'm in the company of a man who... Uh, Hails from Billy Honest. He spent most of his adult life away from Billy Honest, but he's never ever forgotten his roots, and we've so much experience of that down the years. He's done so much to uh, promote the town, and unlike some more Mayo people who might uh, not be proud of their roots, Frank has always been uh, un not shy at declaring his roots and where he's from, and uh, he has never forgotten Billy Honest in, in all his professional life. So, look at Frank, I suppose to start things off, we might say that. Uh, you would have a lot of history here in this particular uh, venue here in, in the Abbey grounds. Oh yeah, a whole lot of history here because number one, coming up the avenue, I just thought about my dad, Tom Greeley, from, we lived out in Devilis that time, and for years he rang the bell here, twice a day, you know, and he worked for the friary here. And um, I remember being up here, I, I ended up milking cows here and trimming the lawns and all that kind of stuff as well. And my brother, of course, was an Augustinian priest for 25 years as well. Okay. And so we have a great kind of heritage here with the, with the Augustinians. Okay. And was there many fires here at the time, do you remember? There would have been about four or five of them. Okay. My dad used to have to carry up the bags of turf upstairs for them in the winter time. And he had a great big garden down, drawing here with uh, Joe Harkin's mayor, a, a mayor called Rose. And I was very good with the horse, actually. And Old MJ Webb wanted me to go and be a jockey at the time. <laughs> yeah, so there was a, there's a lot of good, you know, nice warm memories about the place. And in there, in the in the graveyard, one of my dearest friends in life, Pat Cribben, is buried. He, he oh, got killed in an accident in 1974 in England, and it was he who prompted my whole thing of getting into running. And uh, he was a larger than life character and a great sportsman. Okay. So there's so many things when I look around here, you know. We'll get to the running in a minute, but uh, just when we mentioned the fires and all that, I do wonder, uh, it mightn't be the appropriate place to ask this question now, but we'll say there was a myth that we'll say it was a bit of animosity between the parish church and the fires at the time. There was, and there was a parish priest at one time, I often heard my mother telling the story, that he used to be down at the Friary Gate there, and he'd be driving people over to the parish. <laughs> Uh, and to his dismay, people would kind of ob observe her and, and obey him, but they go down uh, towards the, where the Ulster Bank. There a great, um, would say, I always got this impression that the fires had a great warmth to them or whatever. They had, they had something special. And there was a Father Mansfield here who was particularly, uh, he was renowned all over Ireland and had a lot of healing uh, uh, stories that he had, he had done some extraordinary work in healing people as well. He, he was very, very well known, you know. But they had a great, they had a warm, and of course they were a community as well. And that was, a, that was a lovely thing about it. It's kind of sad when you look at the house there now and that bit of life has gone out of it. And, and uh, they brought a lot to the community. Yeah. Uh, Father Delaney was another uh, man that was known, so he was known far and wide as well. Yeah. And there was always this perception in my head that it was a great place to come for confessions. It's kind of it a thing was. of the past today now, but there was always this thing that people got great peace and healing when they came. They got to the peace Friday. and healing, and and there was a there was a, some Father Father Buckley as well, who was a native of the town. He was here for a number of years as well. But they had that they had that lovely uh, touch. And going to mass in the Friary was kind of different. In in my time, uh, the the uh, reason we went to mass in the Friary was because it was over in fifteen minutes. It was pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, pretty quick job. All right. So, uh, and and Father Buckley in particular was very very fast. Yeah. You know and and. Uh, but there was great crowds here, and you know, this, I always remember Christmas here, and uh, it was a lovely feeling here around the, the crib in here as well. And and and, and um, as a young lad, like I was coming in out of here with my dad, say for once I was about ten years of age, I suppose, when he, when he was working the land here. And uh, but when I was about fifteen, I was milking two or three cows every morning. So they had. Uh, well, they were self-sufficient. They were self-sufficient okay. that time. Yeah, the only thing they had to buy, I think, was meat. Uh, from, I remember Tom Short, the Lord of yes. Mercy, and him, running up there with huge uh, 
uh, pieces. Pieces are, 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 Cut. are uh, cuts of meat all wrapped up in brown paper. Yeah. And the string. And the string. <laughs> oh, luckily the string as well. Okay. Yeah, but they were a great community, and they they they, they left a big legacy in this town. You they know, did absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Have you any funny memories around like that of, of of your time here or any? In 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 uh, this area yeah, here, yeah. I always remember one night uh, I was a little devil on a bicycle that I inherited from my brother, and I'd say I was only a kid, like you must be only up around eight or nine years of age. But I'd be t I was a tear away around town and the guards would be coming out to my parents and everything. And I was up here one night flying around all those uh, lawns. And as people were coming in, I was going in, dodging in and out through them. And um, I came round anyway, one more lap. And some fella, he just, I don't know how he did it, but he lifted me off the bike and the bike went one way and he just dropped me on the ground. And I never did it again. <laughs> you know? So, lesson learned. I was just going to say the message yeah, there yeah. for, for everybody lesson. that's. Uh, Big lesson. So, he, yeah. do, he didn't knock me off the way, he lifted me off it and just let the bike fly away from me. You know, it was, it was lovely. Yeah. Of course, being small helped, uh, helped it the. Did, yeah, the, it the did, process, it did. Yeah. And I was so small growing up and even going to the primary school and going to the college. I was so much smaller. I was everybody. I was everybody else dwarfed me, really. You know, uh, I was, and it took me a lot of years to develop in any shape or form. So I had to fight my corner. And that's, I suppose, leads us on to uh, maybe the running. We'll, we'll stay away from running for a minute. We'll say, yeah. As, when, when you finished school, what 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 stage did you get to at school? We'll say. At I only time? got to the uh, fourth year. I finished in the fourth, college. Was it in the college? Okay. And I kind of. I, I don't know what happened exactly, but I kind of dug my heels in. And there was a, I worked in Durkins during the summers, oh. in the bottom plant in oh. Durkins. And uh, there did a job come up for a junior postman down in the post office. And I went for that and I, lucky enough I got it. So I was two years developing or delivering telegrams all over Ballyhonas. That's how you get to know all the villages. I know the all the villages. Yeah. I knew all the, the, the people and everything that time. And I used to be looking out the window of the post office for hours at, at life just passing through on the streets. Yeah. And maybe not Gerline. And not Gerline as well. <laughs> see, my official name was uh, Junior Postman. Okay. And Johnny on a very busy day, the telegrams, they came down from upstairs and uh, they came down on a shoot, and as sure as heck, it'll be the day that there'll be loads of convent girls in, and he'd want me for some message. So he didn't call me the junior postman. He'd look up the shoot and he'd shout up to Myra Fitzgerald, she was the head telephonist, Myra, will you send down the wire boy? <laughs> that he'd call me the wire boy. So the, I'd be going, you had to walk into the, uh, where he was working. So there'd be a gaggle of girls there, and they'd all shout, so make way for the wire boy. <laughs> and I had to have a uniform and a belt and a little pouch. And it was very embarrassing, yeah. It was, but uh, I had two great years though in the post Excellent. office. Then I went to Dublin to, to work in Dublin, you know. So. And how did you end up in Dublin? I ended up because there was no vacancy in Belly Harness for okay. a postman. Okay. If there had, I might have ended up my days in Belly Harness, okay. doing the town post or okay. something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'd say, when did you uh, experience your first interest in running, or what attracted you to it? Or and the, the Abbey Sports. And my grandfather had often talked to me about he he was a sprinter, and he often talked about as a kid and how impressionable kids. We need to look at that with our grandkids and that how impressionable we can be. He told me these stories about how he'd do all the chores on the farm on a Sunday, and then he'd get a butter, bottle of buttermilk and a few sandwiches and head off walking to some distant sports and he'd win the 100 and the 200. And I was so, that's, that captured my imagination. Amazing. And so when the sports were on, I was running, I think, in the 16 yards or whatever, and I was going to have this great story to tell him when I went back up that evening. And I was running on my bare feet on the grass and I was flying, I was ahead of everybody for about 30 metres and then my feet started slipping and I finished last. And Sick. I said, never again will I have anything to do with running. Until Pat Cribben got me out, the Lord of Mercy, and he's buried in the graveyard there. Mm -hmm. And then Mick Nestor arrived in town with a gaggle of kids, an old beat up car, set up his barber shop in the middle of town. There was an international boxing tournament in the Friary Field many, many mm -hmm. years ago. Oh. So he revived the boxing club that had become dormant. We used to run up to Glora Bridge for road work, and he spotted that a couple of us had a bit of ability to run. Mm -hmm. And then he got us running cross country and stuff. So him and Pat Cribben 
and Michael Joyce would, would, would have another bearing on it as well. They were the ones that kind of got me going. But again, I was so tiny like it. It took me so long to make an impression at all. But when I did, I don't know, I discovered something within myself as well. Just before we, we go on about the running, uh, it just springs to mind, the Abbey pattern, was that a feature in your, in your youth? Was yeah, it? big feature, yeah. big feature. And the tug of war was a great. Yeah, but would say there, there used to be a run as part of that. Was that in your time? Uh, it, there was a run in that when I was in America, I came over and won that one summer. Okay. Uh, from Ballin Lock to, to, to yes. Bally Harness. Yeah. yeah. Cross country, uh, I think it was a Mayo Junior uh, cross country title in the Friary Field. We had we had the national uh, the the Mayo Championship there one year. Okay. So I suppose to get on to your running career, really, uh, you ended up getting a scholarship. Uh, how did that come about? That came about was in 1972. I was running for Donora Harriers in Dublin, and I was running very well, and I got on the Irish senior cross-country team for the World Cross Country. And I met Neil Cusack from Limerick over there. He went on to win the Boston Marathon a couple of years later. And they were looking to recruit a couple of runners. And they recruited that year, they recruited me, and Ray McBride, my dear, dear friend who only died a week ago. Yeah. And the two of us set off on a September <coughs> day to head off for Tennessee. That's the, we were offered scholarships. Now, I was 21 at the time, and I'd been out of school for four years or whatever. But we went off like young dreamers off to America. It was, uh, I had four years there, you know, and, and, and did a lot of running and a lot of other things. I got into writing and other stuff like that over there, you know, so. Uh, there were good years, you know. I didn't fulfil my running promise. Never, never. I, I got injured. I think it was only <coughs> there about six weeks. Uh, but I never fulfilled the full, the fullness of what I thought I could achieve. You know, okay. didn't make the Olympics or anything like that. I know it's it's a shame and yeah. possibly it would have could have happened. But yeah, we'll say. Um, then we we come on to we'll say writing about sport, the Irish runner. How, when did that come about? How that, did that came come out about? in 1981. Okay. And uh, that was by a pure wing and a prayer. Uh, got, I, I, I'd come home and I had let my running kind of go. And I was in Dublin, working in Dublin, in a, in a, for a, a man called Pat Rudy from Ballinab, where he had a couple of magazines. And one of the things I went to do was to go and cover an athletics event. And the photographer that was with me at the time, he said, geez, I can't believe all the people that still remember you that kept coming up to me. So, and I did it on a wing and a prayer with, with a, a bit of help from Michael Joyce at the time. I always remember Michael, I, was, I had a bit of a dilemma. I was working for the first Sunday Tribune and everything was going grand there. And I started the magazine as a kind of a hobby that I'd bring out a couple of times a year. And I used to go around the Phoenix Park handing out handbills for people to subscribe. And one day, I put the wrong <coughs> telephone number on it. I put the number of the Sunday Tribune. So they were getting calls for Frank Reedy, of Irish <laughs> runner. And Hugh McLaughlin, he, he owned the Tribune at the time he called me in. He said, you're going to have to make a decision. He said, you're going to have to either give me full time oh, or yes. give you a And he said, yeah. the magazine won't sustain you. Yeah. And we were only after getting married at the time. And we had <coughs> young Tomas at the time and everything. And I rang Michael Joyce. He was a solicitor. He had qualified as a solicitor at that time. And we've been friends since convent school here. And I said, what do you think I should do? And Michael is the most laid back guy you'd ever meet. And he just said, Yara, give it a go. But we've had these kinds of discussions with a number of people yeah. during these interviews. And uh, in general, that's the reaction I'm getting about uh, most people who set up business. Mm. Uh, you really have to give it a go. You have to give it a go. And we didn't. <coughs> Fellows were coming up to me in Dublin saying, we've done market research on this and this won't work, you know. But it worked because we put passion into it and, and, and kind of, yeah. we were naive as well. Yeah. You know, you weren't, you weren't looking at spreadsheets or anything like that. But it's a known fact that, that often uh, too much knowledge would, yeah. would yeah. prove anything mm. unviable. Mm. You know? It was all done on, on passion and on, yeah. and on kind of wing and prayer job, you know. Yeah. But it worked. But you, you were in that magazine for two or three years, is that right? 37. 37. <laughs> yeah. Then I got lucky. I got lucky there about, what, 15 years ago or whatever. Athletics Ireland took it over and they gave me a job as well. Jesus. And then three years ago, they farmed it out to a publishing company, but they gave me a different job 
promoting a thing called the Daily Mile into primary schools. Okay. I suppose that leads us uh, possibly into this Gratitude Road that, that yeah. you, maybe you'd like to just... Uh, yeah, well, Gratitude Road kind of kicked off last uh, September. Okay. Uh, I decided after... It, with, mm-hmm. I, have a, I, have a, I was very lucky in Dublin that one night in Santry in August, it's actually the anniversary of this coming week, 18th of August <coughs> in uh, 1970, I went out into a, in a 10,000 metres and I ran out of my skin. You do it now and again in your life, like you get one perfect evening. And I set an Irish junior record of 30 minutes, 17 seconds for 10,000 metres. And it's 51 years uh, next week since I did that. But for the 45th anniversary, we had a great night in Santry. And then for the 50th, I said, I want, there's no use in repeating that again. So I said, I'll do something different Just to celebrate and to give a bit of thanks back for a lot of the good things in my life. Mm-hmm. So I was born in the old coom. So I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk from Ballyhonnis to Dublin. In, we did it over 13 days. And I go for the coom hospital, a fundraiser for them. Uh, because my mother uh, had me in Dublin. My brother Tom was born as well prematurely in the old coom. And subsequently she lost between Tom and me, she lost the daughter she always wanted to have in a home birth. And uh, after I was born, when I was about six, uh, the little brother Ger born, and he only survived a few days. <coughs> so I felt I should give something back in some shape or form. And I, the, the word that always was constant was gratitude. So I got this the design done of Gratitude Road, and I've kind of lived by that today because I think, you know, you've only so many days in your life anyway and I've been lucky in a lot of ways a lot of challenges in my life too but I've been very lucky you know that that I got to America I got to cover six Olympics I got to do all kinds of things that were, would only have been a dream as a kid here in Belly Honest you so know. Uh, we went off and we did that walk from up to Dublin you know and and uh, I intend to do it from Dublin back to Belly Honest yet as well well because it was a lovely experience and it was just before the big COVID closed down. Yeah. Yeah. So we were meeting little communities on the yeah. way and a couple of days we had a bit of music and song and stuff like that. I remember the timing was terrible because I know we spoke yeah. about this before yeah. with plans of having maybe a session mm. here and different mm. things. Mm. And, uh, but eventually that will come, you yeah. know, we'll, we'll, we'll eventually have that. But it was good and, and mm. uh, you know, uh, there's a great friend of mine, Declan Coyle, and he has a book called The, the Green Platform. And he, he talks about the fact that uh, Gratitude and negativity, they can coexist. Yeah. So if you have enough gratitude and if you, if, if, you can, if you can help a few people along the way as well, because a lot of people help me, it works. Well, my variation of that would be regarding this series that we're doing now is that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Oh, absolutely. So I love it. I love similar, that. Yeah, it's a similar sort that. of absolutely. A, a, a platitude. Yeah. Um, if you can bring a little bit of joy to people. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he, he, Declan was a former Colombian priest and he, he was out in the Philippines. And he tells the story like that he, he was taking a break and before he took the break, I think 60 <coughs> kids had died in, in a, within a month or two. So he was going back to, after taking the break, and his advisor, he's talking to him, he said, well, has the experience there, has it made you more angry, more bitter, more, or has it made you more appreciative of, of living? So he said, oh, of course it's made me angry, of course it's made me yeah. bitter. So he said to him, he gave him one little bit of advice. So he said, don't go back if you go back like that. He yeah. said, if you can't bring them joy, don't bring them anything. Yeah, that's good. So good, you, yeah, good attitude, yeah. yeah. So look, at, uh, we're going to have a, a song from Frank. We're going to take it to a different part yeah, of the ground here. I, I think we'll possibly meet up with him again, but uh, for, for we might leave that for now and we'll go to a different yeah. venue, a different spot. Absolutely. And you might give us an old blast of a song. And we will, yeah. I'd love to do that past. because uh, that's been one of the, the twin things in my life, music and singing and stuff. And I, I, I got that love for it above from my grandfather, Harry Mannion, in, Bally, in, in uh, Drumban and the old house. He had a... a a gramophone with John McCormack records. He had a library, and not, most people wouldn't have it at the time. And he also had the old Walton songbooks. Oh, wow. So I learned old ballads and everything back then. And, and you know, I always say that to people now with, with grandkids particularly. You never know what they're picking up. No. 
So give them something very positive, you know. That's absolutely, the, the absolutely. Thing. So we'll take a break for a moment, yeah. and we'll be back. Uh, he, he'll get the choir ready to back him up here. Absolutely, and, and, and uh, the, we'll the band is coming soon <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah. Back shortly. Yeah. So here we have it with Frank Greeley, who holds an Irish junior record for 51 years. What we didn't mention earlier on, he's uh, written a couple of books. He has uh, produced the Irish Runner magazine. He, is, he writes songs, he writes poetry. I'm not sure if I've missed anything there, but uh, this evening we're going to get him to sing a song and maybe you'd like to introduce the song yourself, Frank, and, and let us know why you're singing the song this evening. Yeah, the song really is, uh, it's called These Are My Mountains and it's the song that just kind of hits me at the moment because a dear, dear friend of mine, Ray McBride from the Clada in Galway, uh, he died just over a week ago. And uh, we had great times in Tennessee together. We left together in uh, 1972 on the 19th of September to go to Tennessee. And while we were over there, we had a little ballad group as well. And Ray was, of course, was a champion dancer. And uh, we used to do a little gig now and again up in a place called the Carter Family Store up in Hilton's, Virginia. It was only over the border from where we lived. And the Carter family were probably best known as maybe the, 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 the very first people that got uh, country music and, and maybe country folk type music going in America. So they're so renowned. A.P. Carter, his wife Sarah uh, in particular, were the, were the instigators of that. So one night we were up in Hilton's, Virginia, in the Carter family uh, place, and we got up and Ray danced uh, and he enthralled, everybody was enthralled by his dancing and his Irish dancing and Tennessee clogging. And we got up and sang a few songs as well, and this was one of them. And I think it's appropriate that I'm back in Ballyharness. I'm only looking up the hill here. When I was about 17 or so, I used to run about 50 times up those steps at night training. And uh, I always found that it gave me a great foundation. But this is the song anyway. For fame and for fortune, I've wandered the earth, and now I've returned to the land of my birth. I've brought back my treasures, but only to find they're less than the pleasures I first left behind. For these are my mountains, and this is my glen. I see them again. No land ever claimed me. Though far did I roam, for these are my mountains, and I'm going home. The stream by the road sings, at my going by, the lark overhead sings. A welcoming cry, the lake where the trout lies, once more I will see, for it's there my heart lies, it's there I must be, for these are my mountains. And this is my glen, the days of my childhood, I see them again. No land ever claimed me, though far did I roam, for these are my mountains, and I'm going home. Kind faces will greet me and welcome me in. I know how they'll greet me ah, back home again. 
this night round the fireside. Old songs will be sung, at last I'll be hearing my own mother's tongue. For these are my mountains, and this is my glen, the days of my childhood, I see them again. No land ever claimed me, though far did I roam. For these are my mountains, and I'm going home. There we go.